I'm Fiona. I am Team 13 from La Cueva, La Cueva and uh, the name of our project is Tracking System Orbits. Okay, I'm gonna um, so the problem we're trying to address is the growing number of satellites in system orbit. Over the course of the past few years, there have been growing, just been growing numbers of satellites and debris in system orbit, which is the orbit between um, Earth and between Earth and the Moon and a little bit past the Moon. Um, which, because it's so much farther out than low Earth orbit, the luminosity or like how visible the debris and satellites are decreases dramatically, which makes them obviously a lot harder to see and a lot harder to track their positionings. And with that uncertainty and whether they're going to crash in with one of our used satellites or satellites being used currently. Um, collisions like this could cause communication failures and so much more. Let's do use satellites for everything practical in our daily life. Um, this project was originally prompted by AFRL's Lunar Highway Patrol System request. They were trying to find an optimal satellite configuration to track debris in this in this space to predict orbits like this. Um, we basically downscaled the project dramatically because we're not really that good, obviously. <laughs> um, so instead of using satellites, we would assume a debris, like, I don't know, a rock, starting this with, with an albedo of 0.14. And it's going to be much bigger. And so it makes it a lot more visible to see. So we're assuming a kilometer in size, which is obviously more bigger. Um, and because it's circular, it's going to be easier to see rather than satellites, much lower and sharp dimensions and stuff. So our goal is to find a cost-effective system, yet effective satellite configuration to track debris. Are there any questions? So assumptions we had to make are the Earth is stationary, meaning unmoving. The Moon is in a uniform circular orbit. The debris is like the debris size, a kilometer. And the Sun's position is ballpark to eight positions, depending on time of year. And um, we assumed a time step of 10 seconds, which I'll get more into. Um, and the satellites we're assuming we're using CubeSats, which are basically like box size satellites, which is more, a lot more realistic to use since they're not like massive satellites that are like super expensive to launch, as we can talk about, we can talk about in the cost later. Um, but it's a lot more realistic to use the CubeSats. Anyway, so we have four. Four programs we wrote to achieve to support our goal here. Two of which are simulations, one of which is a luminosity program, and another is a cost program. So the two simulations are one to calculate the orbits of the debris, and another to calculate the orbits of a satellite, of the satellites, sorry. The so as we were writing this, it originally started off as a three-body problem, assuming that the Earth and the Moon and whatever satellite we were using were all dependent on each other. We later discovered that that took a heck of a lot of time. <laughs> so we assumed the Earth is going to be still, and we assumed the Earth is going to be in uniform circular orbit, which um, makes it a little bit less accurate, but it saves a lot more time. And of course, the satellite debris you're using is going to be dependent on both those positions. So if there's like a tidal force, it's going to, we're going to see it crash, obviously. Um, so the first program with the debris, uh, actually, we'll start the size the satellites, assumes eight positions in low Earth orbit and four positions on higher Earth orbit, just not a lot higher, just by like two kilometers. Um, and the debris is has a set number of. I'm using a dictionary to like define the different positions, and it runs through the positions and runs through another set of velocities, and each time step changes by um, originally a hundred um, hundred seconds for each time step. But so it starts off with position one. It runs like 
six months, I believe he started off with six months in that configuration and it goes around and changes the velocity with that pre starting position. So in the end, he ends it with around like 108 degree orbits. Um, the satellites, on the other hand, it's basically the same program, but the positions and the velocities are like a set. They come together. So it's basically in a, a circular orbit, but with the amount of air that came um, at some point, it would, it would slowly start spiraling outwards. So that goes back to the time step. We were a little short on time with our communication skills and getting everything done. So when we originally ran it with a time step of 100 seconds, everything went crazy in the program because the accuracy dropped down dramatically. The satellites would pretty much spiral off over the course of a month, which made it very hard for us to work with anything. So that was the point in which we had to submit our final report. So everything after this is pretty much our students' results go um, after the final report. Um, so we re-ran the data with 10 steps of 10, which is a lot better, but of course, still, um, you know, a large time step. Um, are there any questions about the simulation segment? Um, so for each one of the debris and satellites, it would be saved for, for each individual satellite and debris. The coordinates were saved to a file. And for each time step, so you can have the time and the position, the time and the position, and it would tell you when the file name, uh, what you were looking at. And so that information could be sent to the luminosity program, which would, depending on the time of year, change the sun's location around us. So we can get the luminosity specs for the debris. It finds the phase of debris, the phase of input for debris. It finds the sides of the angles and distance to the debris, the earth, and the moon, just so it can figure out like its positioning. And based off the distance from the satellite used and the debris being used, it calculates the apparent magnitude or apparent luminosity of the um, debris um, using the inverse square law. And um, yeah, so then the luminosity is saved to a file with the same time steps. Um, so the way that it was originally set up is it picks one debris and one satellite and sees like how often it's in view and in range. Um, so yeah, it, that's the way that um, program works. And also inputting the satellite type or camera type we're using, we're using high, mid, and low end. So you can see for our low end, well, the quantum efficiency stays the same, 0.95 or 95% for, for all, the, like, all the camera specs. Luminosity radius from low end is 0.016, mid end is 0.05, and high end is 0.03. Shutter speed is five seconds for all camera types and field of view. The low end is 62 degrees, mid is 45, and high end is 65. Um, so basically, you just took that into account when he's calculating the um, just amount of light collected, the total number of joules, figuring out the aperture of the lens and the quantum efficiency just to see how much the computer actually reads from what is being emitted. And so from there, the cost program sees the high, mid, and low end, which one was used, seeing what type of orbit is being used, and it calculates like um, the cost is dependent on like the field of view, the shutter speed, the lens, the width of the satellite, the runtime of like, managing it, and the number of satellites. Um, take the factors like the weight of the satellite, um, to the number of satellites, and add them to the total cost. The launch cost is very dependent or very finicky, most likely because we're using sat cubes, which you can send a whole bunch of them at the same time and they're a lot less to send it. So that's why the cost numbers here might seem a little bit low for that. Um, so basically, they concluded with what we saw is that the high 
the higher orbiting satellites were not cost efficient for their a proximity to the satellite's worth. So like the closer you are to the satellite, supposedly the more light you collect. But we discovered that even with its approximation, it costs less just to send like another um, another satellite to cataract having to send them out. So we basically crossed off higher orbit as any options for us for configuration wise. And um, let's see. So we have a few examples here of like high end, low end orbit. The um, simulations we're used, to, used for these examples were basically either chaotic or regular. The chaotic orbits were pretty much very far off. So in this video, it's pretty much basically a circular orbit is what you'll see. Um, so you can see with the examples here, one satellite at low end sees about 1.02 e to the minus 11 joules. Um, but you can see three satellites with the <laughs> three satellites with the mid end sees average a lot less than that, just because of the observed orbit use. So the distance makes up a big factor. We had to assume we could kind we could see the debris in the first place. Whereas like in reality, obviously there'd be stars and there'd be just like, there'd be so many other factors than what we're using right now um, in this. So yes, we'd be assuming we know where the debris is originally. Um, I would say for, if we were to continue this project, one thing that we definitely did poorly was our communication skills. We, we're not all on the same page as what we were working on. Um, for example, the simulation calculates the debris and satellite positions in three dimensions. Uh, but we originally started the project in two dimensions. So everything was in two dimensions, meaning luminosity. And when we moved to three dimensions, it was unclear as to what we were doing. So the FOV, uh, field of view only calculates two dimensionally, whereas the simulation is in three dimensions. So for the orbits I made, that are off by degree aren't going to be seen at all. So that would definitely be something we could improve on, as well as rerunning the data with larger time, uh, sorry, smaller time steps, and having a the Earth and the Moon in um, in elliptical orbits like dependent on each other. <coughs> um, we also didn't visualize early enough. We were very confused. All of our programs were dependent basically on the simulation. And if that works complete, the others had to like basically wait. So we definitely have to improve on our structure of how we organize our programming like divisions. Um, and we would like to run the program a lot more. We only got like a little bit of data. We like barely were able to finish on time just with this. So we would like to be able to like try multiple configurations and have like more satellites and see how like with more accurate satellites and more accurate degree what the effect would be um as far as like accuracy and tracking would be for example if we were to like we, we only explored up to eight kilometers away from the earth for um orbits with the satellites but if we were to try putting a satellite in the Lagrange point, like relative to the graph, like pretty far off, right? It might be way more costly, but it might be way more effective. So we would have liked to explore more areas in that. Are there any questions? And I have a diagram, not diagram, video for you guys. Basically just shows, just, I guess, the thing running all together. Once it opens. Um, so you can see the moon, the Earth, the debris in an almost circular orbit. And here we have four satellites going around the Earth. And as you can probably see at this point, the satellites are starting to spiral slowly away from the Earth. So that's most likely an effect from our um, art time step being so large. 
So what's one reason you'd like to make smaller time steps? Um, so I'd like to hear a little bit about your team. And before that, I think it's great that you guys continued working after you wrote the report. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 When you're when you interested enough in the project and when you get to talk to us and you're telling us about what happened after the report, that's just wonderful. Yeah. So you, tell John. us a little bit about your team. Okay, so um, there's Hadwin and Kylan. So they're both guys in my um, computer science class. I wrote the simulations, Hadwin wrote the luminosity, and Kylan wrote the cost program. Um, I'd say Hadwin is the only person keeping us together. <laughs> We're all massive procrastinators, right? So it was very hard to like actually submit the final report. Like it, we kind of cut it close a little bit um, with like everything. Um, Hadwin was the only reason like we had any time management at all. He'd be the one keeping us on track. Um, Kylan was kind of the slacker in the group. If they watch this, it'll be bad. But um, yeah, it's kind of true. Um, and Hadwin was, I don't know, he's the one with like the great debugging skills. He helped me a lot with the debugging. A lot of it for Hadwin, like easily look like easily Google. You can easily look it up on Google, like inverse square law. But um, a lot of it was my father. He's a physicist, so he was like teaching me the math for writing the program. Mm -hmm. And you can like cross check with um, Google with all of your matrices and vectors and stuff. So mm -hmm. um, that's mostly where a lot of it came from. I mean, it's a huge problem. It's a really important oh, yeah. problem. Um, I think, you know, it's always important to sort of start simply and add some complexity. And it, honestly, it sounds like that's what you've done. And you're positioning yourselves to be able to add more complexity. Thank you. Yes. And I thought it was really cool. A lot of people try to tackle space programs and problems. and and seeing you guys actually look at the cost of what it would yeah. take to do something, that's critical because we can talk all day about, sure, how are we gonna solve this problem? But if it's not monetarily feasible and we're not taking that into account at the beginning and our, our first steps, um, then our likelihood of success or anyone doing anything with that information is kind of low. So I really appreciate you guys taking that into effect and to, you know, um, thoughts and, and everything. Thank you. I'm curious how you went about estimating the light gathering capability of nano satellites specifically. C can you walk me through like what the different camera types and qualities were? And if you were at the level of kind of doing aperture size with shutter speed calculations, like how, how what all factors were involved in calculating whether or not you could see the debris? So I don't know as much about the computer, um, Camera side, but I can tell you what I do. Um, as far as it being able to be seen, is that what you're asking? Like, yes. how, okay, so uh, we have the few factors we have our economy <coughs> efficiency, the lens radius, the shutter speed, and field of view. Um, do all those terms make sense? Uh, yeah, I was actually sort of confused why the lens radius was changing on the low, mid, and high end cameras. Oh, okay, so, um, so the like, okay. The lens radius is proportional to the amount of light you're going to be able to see. So obviously the bigger collector of light you have, the more light you're going to see. And I, that's why there's also a price in between the high mid and low end, because the higher end cameras have are bigger, but they receive more light. Um, does that answer your question? Kind of, yes. Sorry, yes. Uh, yeah, it's, it, that's one where, it, in actual nano satellite instances, you end up with weird step functions of what size the camera fits in a nano X tube. Yes. So. 